Well, here we are. This uh, looking at Book of Mercy, and I haven't heard your latest album. And no, it's, it's not out yet. I just, I just put the name on that list. Oh, I see. Various Positions is the name of the album, which uh, has this uh, suggestion of the uh, uh, eroticism. Kama Sutra. Kama Sutra, really, Kama Sutra. And at the same time, same year, we have Book of Mercy, which is what the, the other... Holy and, Joe. The whole thing. <laughs> it's really the whole thing. How did, how did Book of Mercy come about? I notice it's dedicated uh, to your teacher. Could you tell Whoever us Whoever that, that is. Though right. this is a, a book uh, that uh, wasn't planned. Uh, I don't think anybody deliberately sits down to write it uh, because I don't want to mislead anybody. It's a book of prayer. And uh, unless you, uh, you know, have no other recourse and your life is so dismal, and uh, unyielding as to need a book of prayer, that this book will couldn't possibly have any significance for you. But there are people for whom it might be useful. What about yourself? For me, it was not just useful, but urgent. So um, it comes out of, uh, as I say, not a literary decision to uh, you know add another prayer to a world which has great uh, a great liturgical literature but it was just the only expression available to me at that kind of moment and uh, I fumbled around for several years before I could even speak about these things and it was a pressing need to speak and it was a pressing need to address myself to the source of things and that's what the book is about and now it's over and I'm just the same messy character I always was there's no conversion I haven't entered theology, I'm not evangelical about it, but that is the record of how a heart was shattered and unified. The one thing which really comes through, I think, in all this is at, at first look is this, uh, uh, this, this sense of desperation, um, which sort of underlies this, this whole thing. And I wonder if you could, uh, are you prepared to tell us a little about just uh, the sorts of things oh, which led to this? it hurts, it hurts. <laughs> There's nothing you can say about it. Everybody knows, uh, you know, everybody has their own domain of tiny suffering. And, uh, you know, when, we're f when we see, we can't ignore the evidence of, of vast suffering in, before us that we don't even have, we can't even dare to compare our suffering to the suffering that we see manifested all around us. But nevertheless, even in this domain of tiny suffering that each of us occupies, there are moments when it becomes unmanageable. And, and when you uh, are silenced and when the taste goes out of things and where you just can't touch anything. And a great silence comes down and you gag and you want to speak. And you want to reach out, and so that uh, in those moments like that, um, many people find recourse, solace in their own traditions, uh, as I did, uh, and uh, a vocabulary is suggested in which you can locate and address the deep source of things to try to make some sense, and just simply to ask for help. And uh, this book comes out of that kind of asking. I think in one of the very, uh, I think it was the first one, the, the first of these, um, they've been described as psalms, uh, you say prayers, call them meditations on the, the, the whole issue. You talk about uh, being 50, about uh, 50 years, and uh, this is your song, this is, you're going to sing no higher. That seems to suggest that a lot of this material actually did, or was this a literary device, uh, come out of a fairly recent sort of um, what, outburst? Uh, the, the, these, uh, these pieces were written uh, about a year and a half ago, and they took about a year to assemble. And as I say, they involved two or three years of stumbling around in a, in a landscape of... Um, inutility in the landscape of uh, frustration. Uh, and 
and uh, the book itself is the record of uh, the heart emerging from this landscape uh, because it happened and uh, that's really about all you can say about it uh, is that it happened uh, the appeal was made the response was swift and uh, the healing took place what are the symptoms of uh, the health then? Well, as I say, this doesn't, you know, this is not the work of an enlightened, fully realized master of the spirit. You know, this is the, this is the work of a civilian of the spirit. Uh, and it might be useful to other civilians of the spirit. It just verifies a certain kind of promise that each of us has dimly heard a, a certain kind of promise that there is a source of healing, that there is a torrent of mercy, and that it operates in mysterious ways, and it isn't it always isn't available, but with a, with a, with appeal, it can be located. But I, I, it's not it's not a book of um, spiritual mastery. Not a prescription for. Uh, it's not a prescription, no. Looking at one of your uh, your previous albums, I think it actually was recent songs. There are a couple of songs in there in which you acknowledge uh, um, the, uh, uh, the what the gift of the poetry of Rumi and uh, and Attar in this. It, was this part of your uh, your your thinking as you began to put together these things? Well, I've always been uh, interested in you know these dismal concerns of the spirit. And uh, you know there are some there are some uh, voices in this landscape that are sublime. You know, Rumi, who was uh, a, midi uh, a, a medieval um, a Sufi singer, poet, and Attar, who was nearly his contemporary. I mean, these voices are superb. Uh, uh, we're reading them in translation. We don't hear the music. But still, uh, I don't think that uh, I don't think there's ever been such a in all the, the the poems and prayers that I know. There's never been such an ecstasy and uh, such a such dancing feet, such devotion, such hopeless love, uh, such a wounded heart as uh, these two men manifested six or seven hundred years ago. So this uh, I would, I know, if if anybody has nothing to do, and you really have to fill yourself with nothing to do, I think, to approach these kind of writers, or even to approach my little work, which in comparison is like the ant to the mountain. Uh, if you have nothing to do and you feel your soul unemployed in a deep sense, if you if you have any taste for the thing, these the, these poets or these singers, Attar and Rumi, can uh, can can bring delight to the heart. Attar and Rumi uh, sing from the, the Sufi, the uh, uh, mystical Islamic tradition. As I read through uh, Book of Mercy, I I couldn't help but uh, but feel how. How incredibly Jewish it really uh, the Book of Mercy really is. is it this, doesn't this, look Jewish. <laughs> this this sense of uh, walking around talking to God the way it happens in the, in in the Bible all the time. That kind of conversation with eternity, I suppose, is uh, well. It certainly is deep in the in the in the Hebrew tradition in the Jewish tradition. Yeah. The chutzpah to speak to God. To uh, uh, put him down sometimes, as well as to uh, to glorify him. Well, it's uh, I don't know if this book partakes in that, but there is a tradition of uh, of questioning God for his uh, uh, to to explain or at least to justify his activities. That does uh, there is that implication, I think. You know. You know, in, in biblical literature, let's see who who does that. Uh, I forget. At one point, uh, I think you say, perhaps in more than one point, you say, "Though I don't believe." Well, I uh, I say that a couple of times. Though I don't believe, I come to you now, and I lift my sins to your mercy. 
I lift my doubt to your mercy. I lift my doubt to your mercy. The, uh, the affliction of unbelief or disbelief is, uh, is common to anyone who uh, jumps into this deep water. Uh, and I think it's a legitimate, a legitimate concern for anybody who uh, who finds themselves in this in these kinds of predicament. And I don't think it represents uh, agnosticism or atheism. I, I was reading a review of this book in the Montreal Star where they called it atheistic. And I was wondering, you know, there are some circles in the United States where Reagan is considered a communist, you know, and. Uh, I was wondering at the intensity of this reviewer's devotions that she would view my little effort as atheistic. You know, I could think of a lot of other ways to put it down, but I, I, her her uh, her attachment to the spirit must be fierce to consider mine atheistic. But uh, I think that uh, the problem of doubt is a very real problem and a very legitimate problem and a problem that you can bring to the deepest source. It is like a wound. It is like a, a boil. It is an affliction. And uh, like every other affliction, it can be uh, brought to the deepest source of your being and uh, and laid out there and, uh, and, um, and viewed for what it is. So just because I say that, it doesn't mean I do or I don't because the mind that... Um, the mind that debates the problem of the existence of these things is never the mind that supplies the answers anyways. Now, we have a highly developed tool called the mind that continually moves between yes and no. And in those kind of binary movements, it creates rocket ships to the moon, great cities, uh, complicated artistic masterpieces, but it never supplies answers to the reason for our existence, to the reason for suffering, to where we came from, to where we go. The mind is not designed for those kinds of answers. It's designed for inspired questions and inspired observations. Uh, there's another faculty that uh, uh, addresses itself to these questions and addresses it with sometimes with words, sometimes without words. And in even under the scornful regard of the intelligence saying, there is no God, or there is, or there might be, or let's hedge our bets, or let's not. Even under the scornful regard of this intelligence, that other faculty operates in its own terms, and it operates with answers, and it operates with solace, and with comfort, and it operates like beggars under a mighty bridge, the mighty bridge of the intelligence trying to unify the whole cosmos. Under that, there's some beggars sleeping, and in their dream, they understand. Uh, they they can reconcile, and it's a terrible thing to say because you don't want anybody to use this as an excuse to inflict suffering or to maintain suffering. But in that dream under the bridge, the heart discerns something about suffering. It seems that throughout the book, although there is this the, this element of uh, of uncertainty about things, there there is nonetheless at the very end a kind of a resignation. It's a sense of, look, I don't know this is true. And again, I, I hear your mind talking there. I don't know this to be true, but in just sort of presenting something down there and letting something happen, letting something reveal itself to you. I think in these conversations that you have with the deepest source of things, you can't put yourself on and you can't you can't put the one to whom you address you cannot put this one on either so there's no point in standing up there smiling or standing up there crossing yourself or kneeling down reverently when all concerned in this conversation know exactly how you feel about things so the only the only position you can take is the truth to the moment as you discern it. And uh, you, you cannot present yourself as anything but what you are in this thing. And I, I think this book does present that 
that questioner, that asker, that beggar, presents him exactly as he was at the moment, you know, give or take a few, you know, flaws that um, I don't have the, you know, I, I mean descriptional flaws. I, I, the, the, it is a flawed one asking, a perfect one. Uh, but the, I, I think that the put on is is as uh, minimal as anything that I've ever done. It seems uh, throughout the book also that although you are talking from an, a tradition, um, which perhaps we can loosely label Jewish, the Jewish tradition, and biblical, I prefer biblical. They, that's that's kind of it. Uh, they. they there is a sense of, of trying to go beyond, in the book, the ideas of what people have, uh, people have talked about God, about this sort of ultimate being. You don't, uh, you're not propagandizing uh, a particular kind of, uh, what, ambience in it through this book. Well, you know, this kind of conversation, which is uh, very interesting, I hope it is to, to our listeners too, but it is to me, um, and it's, uh, it's luxurious. Uh, this kind of conversation. It comes after the fact. Uh, and it comes out of, you know, a, a gift of health that we both have and of opportunity to be able to sit here and talk about such things. But we know that uh, the book itself, or this expression itself, not just my little book, but that kind of expression comes out of a situation where the health and welfare of the body and the spirit are deeply threatened. And that is, w when you see the world and you see the laws of brute necessity which govern it, it, that is the moment when you see that, when you experience it, when you come to the edge of it, if you don't happen to be totally annihilated or crushed by it as millions of people are every day, you know, you know if you, you have the luxury to see under what brute laws of necessity this world operates. Then as Simon Weil says, as soon as you see that, your soul becomes glued to prayer. And you realize that the only way that you can reconcile this butcher shop of history, this veil of suffering, the only way you can reconcile it to sanity is to glue your soul to prayer. And... Um, that's only discernible by experience. You know, the, it, it, I, don't, I don't have a program. I'm not trying to say this is so, but it is discernible, and and great spirits have discerned it and written about it. It's not a great spirit that is writing the book. It may be informed by a great spirit. It's a little book, as I say, not written from the point of view of spiritual mastery, but written from the point of view of of asking and. Uh, it does ask as honestly as it can. And it's not honest enough. It's not naked enough, but it, it has the elements. But as we say, we discuss that after the fact, when we have the luxury to look at the thing. The thing did not come out of luxury because the soul does not glue itself to prayer out of a luxurious or abundant or powerful predicament, just the opposite. In the luxury of uh, looking at the world, it's, it seems that it's almost a contradiction in terms. If you look at this, as you describe it, this butcher shop, it's, it doesn't seem very luxurious. Uh, that uh, perhaps the, the greater response, um, the response of the greater number of people would be to simply withdraw, to, you know, close your eyes to what's, to what's going on, to the, the real vision of the world. And the rest I, are condemned to prayer. Yeah, I don't think you can withdraw from this scene. And I think that uh, that there is something written on the heart that nobody can avoid, and that there are uh, there are laws under which we operate and which we cannot break with impunity. And I don't even want to say what they are. I just know that they are written on the heart, and that uh, we disobey them, and we immediately know that we have sinned, and and if if we know it well enough, then we we throw ourselves down and ask for mercy. Because the punishment is immediate. Sin is its own punishment. It is the sense of 
being abandoned by the by the source of things. It is a sense of being cast out, and that's something that none of us can tolerate. That is true to not only uh, your own tradition, but of course to to many other traditions. This this concept of the the ultimate sin and the ultimate punishment is simply apartness from God. It's the it's the feeling of uh, abandonment or yes, apartness, alienation, strangerhood. But on the other hand, without that feeling, that's why I say, "Blessed art are you who has given each man a shield of loneliness." Without that shield of loneliness, we would dissolve into ignorance. It is that loneliness that invites us to consider these things. And without it, uh, we wouldn't consider anything. You mentioned, the, uh, of course, the, the law under which the, uh, the Jewish tradition usually operates. The, the law is usually a prescription of uh, those things which are permissible and those things which are not permissible. And it seems to me it's a, it, it, in a sense, it flies in the face of what you're telling me about the, the real nature of, of something like sin, you know, where the punishment is immediate. You don't need, need a law to tell you that this is wrong. Well, uh, wh- what I mean by law, and, and I move, you know, the my mind migrates all over the place uh, in, in, uh, among those things. I, I don't necessarily mean the Hebraic code of what is permissible to eat and do and think. I mean that there is a notion of limit that is written in our hearts, that there is a law in that sense, that we know how far we may go in any moment in any moment, uh, and that uh, there are boundaries that are that we understand and and violate, and and uh, as soon as we violate them, we are plunged into misery. And uh, there are ways, sometimes uh, that misery is so profound that it can only be paid for by death. Sometimes it it can be paid for by penance. But that doesn't mean you have to crawl on your knees up to the cathedral. There's all kinds of psychic... These are taking place on a, on a, on a landscape which is, is subtle, but nevertheless, each of us lives in a very subtle landscape. And uh, it is a recognition of how subtle your landscape and my landscape is that could present the possibility of, of our speaking to each other, of our acting with each other. The, 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 it is the, uh, the deepest violation to another man is to, is to disregard or ignore the subtlety of his landscape or to believe it is less subtle than yours. It isn't. And the basis of uh, any possibility between human beings is the recognition of the subtlety of that landscape. That is what the idea of law is. The idea of law is the limitations that we have to place on our activities and even our thoughts so that we don't violate the subtlety of another man's landscape. That's what I mean by the law that has been revealed. We know about it. There's everything going now to make us believe it doesn't exist. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of devices and and, and great powers have uh, marshaled uh, great energies to try to convince us that this subtlety does not exist. But that is, the law has been revealed. You know, if you want to call it the lawmaker or inspiration or in Jeremiah it says it will be written on the heart, I believe it is. So there has to be, uh, on, on the very personal level, you you have to sort of overcome the uh, what the current uh, kind of move in our own society of uh, see- seeking no limits to what you can do. Yeah, yeah. Seeking no limits. Seeking no limits. Seeking no limits is a very different thing than being free from limits. The act of seeking of no limitation is a, is violence. 
but there is a kind of condition where you may where, where, where you are so glued to the laws of understanding that you are free from those laws. That's a very nice idea, a nice state to get into. I ain't there, incidentally. Does this book represent, um, in, in some respect, uh, a penance of your own? Well, my mother told me not to talk about sex or religion. Should we call that it? Let's call that it. <laughs>